All right, you guys, let's go ahead and get started. How is everyone doing? Good? Summer. You guys, it's summer, yeah. We, have, we don't have the cold anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Not good. We have a little bit of rain. But, um, so welcome. And today, uh, Dan Russell is coming to talk about 1031 Exchange. It's passed around. If you haven't received one, I'm sure everyone did. Um, and so we're really excited about that. On the back table before you leave, we have the flyer, tiny flyer for um, next month. We have Robert and his wife and daughter. Is your daughter coming too? Or no, your wife? Carla and I. Okay, so Carla and Robert will be up. Unless, unless you make her come to the she actually goes to the Okay, okay, <laughs> I didn't know that. So um, they're going to be coming and talking about something a little bit different, but a little bit similar. So, as you know, Robert is property manager. He owns uh, PMI he and his wife. What's that? PMI Reno. Yes. Um, and they will be talking, they'll be shedding some light on property management for short term and midterm rentals. Mostly short term. Or mostly short term. Okay, great. Um, so, I don't want to miss that. That's pretty interesting. And I think there's a lot of companies out there, and I was trying to share that with you, is a lot of companies out there that are acting like property managers for short-term rentals. You gotta be really careful with that as a property owner, reliability. And I'm not sure everyone realizes that. So I had a client that had uh, purchased a property with me and moved out of town, and he, he was looking for someone to property manage or whatever. So of course, I would come over to Robert. And he ends up, with some other people. And he's calling me, he's like, Ginger, I, this property management company that I hired, um, they're renting out the property, they found tenants, and you know the washer, dryer, whatever went out, and they won't go get a new one. They won't get a handyman to come you know, replace it. And I'm like, well, that's weird. And I'm like, they know you live out of state, right? Come to find out, he had switched it over to short-term rental. They you know, furnished it and stuff, which is great. Um, and then they're acting like they're property managers, but they're not. And so they're getting tenants into the property. And I don't know where the crossing of the lines on that are, but as an owner, like that's just totally open yourself for, up for liability when you have someone that's not a licensed property manager managing the short term. So anyway, hopefully you guys cover some of that. Yeah. I don't know. And we'll talk a little bit about the legislative session too. Uh, and the legislative ses session, which we're all super curious about. Um, some of the people were concerned about what was the the um, two eighty is two eighty nine like rent control in there. That was vetoed, but there's some other little things that they snuck in there during legislative se session, right? They may have. I haven't. Brought okay. Well, anything. sorry. You're gonna you're gonna cover that next month, so I'm not gonna. But, sorry. But I can say that uh, the governor is probably. Protecting what we have with the laws now. Yeah. Not, not, he's trying to protect against going towards these Californians of these states. Yeah. The municipalities that are going to be these crazy laws that will hurt you. Too. Awesome. Good to hear. Um, so I want to go ahead and get um, into the 1031 exchange. So normally we'll go around the room. We'll do that at the end if we have time. But I want to make sure, you know, most of you guys came for the speaker, not for this. Does anyone have any topics before we get to that that you want to cover? Rents? You want to talk about rents? I talked about it, but it's, uh, we got a sheet back here that's kind of shows yes. what the market's like. It's, uh, it's different, for sure. We've got some areas in the housing market that's been still increasing, mostly single family, multifamilies. Yeah, we'll talk for the rent. Okay. Take, take a look. If you have any questions, just uh, have my cards back there. Just give me a call. I can help you. Awesome. Thanks, Robert. Um, in the back, there's like also another little flyer. Um, I somehow made it. I was nominated for um, Best of Northern Nevada or what is it, Reno News and Review? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. so. Congratulations. I really appreciate it. 
so much nominated. I would love to win. So if you guys want to snag one of those little sheets in the back and scan it, and you have to vote for 10 things for um, your vote to count. So if you need some suggestions, uh, my friend Heather is voted best lawyer. Heather Imes, so you can vote for her. Um, and I can send you a whole list if you need that. But whatever. Heather's, you Heather's great. Heather's great. A voter's guide. Heather's great. Was that a voter's guide? Yeah, I'll give you a voter's guide. <laughs> yeah, I had to do that for some people. They're like, I don't know who to vote for. I'm like, here. <laughs> um, so, what's that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. One cash, <laughs> Mom Tracy. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> Not that I would know. Um, all right, so we're going to get to it. Do you want to come in and, and introduce yourself and tell everyone about you and? Why we brought you and why you're why you're the person to go to for 1031. Sounds good. Okay. No, please hold your thunderous round of applause. <laughs> okay, okay. So yeah, I'm Russell Marsan, senior vice president with investment property exchange services. We're the largest qualified intermediary in the nation. So all we do is handle 1031 exchanges. And I've been doing it for 27 years. Um, so I am your personal 1031 resource, right? And get us in that not very long time only about an hour, right? That's a short time period in the scope of all 1031 information. So I want to make this very clear. I don't want you to remember anything I say tonight. What's the one thing I want you to remember? Your name. My phone number. <laughs> right, my phone number. Uh, you can put this uh, in your contacts. Don't put this in your contacts. It's my cell phone number. Don't put me in your contacts as just Russell Morrison with investment propagation services. The reason why I say that is because like, I believe in my heart of hearts that you guys are going to think about me like all the time after tonight. Like, tomorrow, you're like, hey, I wonder what Russell's wearing today. <laughs> yeah, that's what I believe. The reality is, you're going to completely forget about me, right? And a month from now or two months from now, you're going to have an exchange need and you're going to forget my name. You're going to be like, what was his name? What's his name? So put 1031 right in there somewhere. That way, when you search 1031s, up, I will pop in your contacts. And that's my cell phone. You can call me anytime. Um, I actually cover Northern California, Northern Nevada, Idaho, and Montana, so I travel a lot. But wherever I'm at, you can reach me on my cell phone. Um, and if you call me at 9 o'clock at night, you don't have to say, hey, I'm sorry for bugging you at 9 o'clock at night. I'm a tax nerd, so by default, I actually don't have a life. Uh, you guys are giving me a life by simply calling me and asking me tax questions. Um, so is there anything, before we get off into you know, the topics I'm going to cover, is there anything you knew 1031 was happening tonight? Is there anything you came here wanting to know for sure? Anything about 1031? Yes. Okay. I'm looking at an exit strategy for a 1031 okay. rental home. Okay. Into an industrial warehouse. Okay. Um, I don't have the name of that right now, but sure. Um, where they actually purchase Amazon uh, distribution warehouses. Right now, their current offering is a property in Kansas and near Tampa or both sure. distribution warehouses. The returns aren't as good as I'd like, somewhere in the 5.8%. Um, but, you know, I'm at a point in my life where I don't want to spend another winter like I did in Truckee, getting snow off the roof when I could have been skiing to try to rescue a rental house. Yeah, yeah. Which is a huge part of my income stream. Sure, sure. And so I'm done with it. It needs a new deck. It needs paint. And so I'm over it. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm too old to be shoveling snow over my head at this point in my life. And you know, so I'm I'm looking at a better alternative sure. than what I'm into. And I don't have a lot of choice. You know, I haven't sure. figured out all the alternatives. So that's kind of what I'm looking for. Out of yeah, you got it. I'll definitely I'll cover that in detail. Um, I was planning on that even without you asking for it. Um, what you're talking about is like a DST, a Delaware Statutory Trust. Yes. Yeah. So and I'll, I'll absolutely discuss that tonight because it's something that very few people actually know about. But I will absolutely cover that. Tonight. Yes. My question is regarding land. Okay. Um, my father owns over 700 acres in selling. And it's been income property because he's run cattle on it and he's used it for timber and that sort of thing. But he wants to exchange that into um, apartment buildings or something like that. Is that possible? 
You're going to love the answer. I am going to cover that tonight, but you're going to love the answer to what I have to say. I'll cover that in detail, absolutely, too. Hey. Yes. Um, so I'm looking at energy utility on exchange, and I'm concerned that with the lack of inventory in the current market, that's going to make it really hard to identify and like name candidate properties. So sure. strategies to do on that. Okay. Yeah. I'll talk about that too. Excellent. All great questions. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, I'm uh, interested in more of the creative financing of real estate, you know, like wholesale and subject to stuff of that nature. I'm just wondering how I could utilize a 1031 exchange if at all possible. And also just uh, understanding that some of the rules under the current administration have changed with regard to 1031s. So just knowing uh, what's currently uh, trends uh, on that. So nothing's changed under the current administration. They are trying to change it. They won't do it. They won't be successful. Right? Previous administration did change the yeah. um, but but it, it, it didn't impact real estate. Um, sure. but yeah, I can absolutely cover that. Although your financing question, so be a little bit more specific. Are you talking about uh, are you talking about like exchanging into notes and deeds of trust? Or are you just talking about ways to finance a replacement property? Yeah, probably more more so selling on property and doing installment sale. Uh, just understanding, you know, I'm looking to help people with being subject to or owner financing type of deals, uh, doing wholesaling and wondering. If at all, a 1031 exchange can uh, be a tool to utilize with those types of strategies. Because I know that 1031s are more of a good tool for traditional approaches. You know, I sell a house, take those proceeds, we can 1031. Uh, just wondering if I could do a 1031 when doing more creative uh, real estate investments. So, once again, so let me just be specific on this because I want to make sure I answer it for you. So, you're talking about what if I buy a replacement property, can I get creative on the financing of buying the replacement property? Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter what I'm going to get in an exchange. It doesn't matter if it's an installment sale from the seller. It doesn't matter if it's a hard money loan. It doesn't matter who, who is actually doing that loan, whether it's traditional or non-traditional. It doesn't matter if it's Tony Soprano. Right? It could be any of those things. Uh, that's replacing debt in exchange. So you're fine. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk first of all, just 1031 in general, right? And kind of the motivation to do a 1031. 1031, section 1031 is actually the greatest wealth building tool in the entire internal revenue code, right? Because it allows real estate investors to reposition, to buy and sell real estate throughout the course of their entire life without having to pay any taxes. Right? Therefore, you can carry forward what you would have paid in taxes, you get to carry forward into the next property. It means the next property has more equity, potentially more cash flow, more appreciation, right? You blend yourself out by more property, but you keep that money working for you during your life instead of giving it up. Um, now, some people will say, you know, hey, Russell, I calculated the tax in my own mind. I'm not going to do an exchange because I calculated the tax in my own mind, and it's not that much. There's two red flags in that statement. What is one? You're thinking. Yes, yes. You've calculated it in your own mind. Right? A lot of people just buy real estate. Right? They haven't sold real estate. They buy and hold. And if you haven't sold real estate in 15 or 20 years, you might not be familiar with what the actual tax rates are. Right? Current tax rates, as a lot of people will tell me this, especially in states like Nevada, right, where you guys are blessed to not have a state tax. They'll say, well, I'm selling an investment property. I'm not going to do an exchange because I'm only paying 15% of the taxes. Probably not accurate. It's physically impossible for somebody selling an investment property to only pay 15% of taxes because there's layers of taxes, right? Capital gains tax, uh, which is based on appreciation, right? So you bought a property for $200,000, you sold it for $300,000, the $100,000 it appreciated, that's capital gain, right? That's, and that's taxed as capital gain, which is between 15 and 20% to the feds. Whether you pay 15 or 20% uh, depends on your adjusted gross income. Right. So if you're a Nevada resident and selling a Nevada property, there's no state tax. That's cool. If you are, though, a Nevada resident and selling a California property, you're subject to California tax. Right. So because any state, you, any state you sell in, any state you sell in, that state has first right of taxation. Right. And then secondarily is the state of residence. Right, so if if you if it was the opposite, well, actually, it's the bad. Nevada's a bad example because zero tax. But let's say you sold in Idaho, but you were a California resident. Right, Idaho's tax is like around six percent. Um, so you would pay Idaho six percent. California, the uppermost tax is thirteen point three percent. So whatever your tax, if your tax bracket is higher than six in California, 
you would owe California the difference, right, between what you paid Idaho, right? So, and so the state of the property is the first right of taxation. Um, but if it's Nevada, then there's no state tax. Um, but there's also depreciation recapture, right? If you're selling an investment property like a rental, um, then you've taken depreciation. Well, every year you take depreciation, you're actually lowering your cost basis by that amount, right? So if you're taking $10,000 of depreciation a year and you've been depreciating that property for 10 years, you've lowered your basis by 100,000. Right? So if you bought it for 500,000, your basis is not 500,000, it's 400,000. And if you sell it for two, for 700,000 and it's a $400,000 basis, Right, so the two hundred thousand dollars is taxed as gain. The hundred thousand dollars is taxed also, but that's taxed at a higher rate to the feds. That's just a flat twenty-five percent. So it's five to ten percent more on the depreciation recapture than it is on the gain. Right, so when you blend those two together, you know it's it's impossible to pay fifteen percent because you're going to be paying more than that. And then the last tax is the affordable health care tax, right, and that one's three point eight percent on top of all of this. So even as a Nevada resident, it's possible for you guys to pay, you know, 20, 25% in taxes when you're selling an investment property, depending on how much you appreciate it and whether or not that affordable health care tax goes. Right. So it's always good if you're not doing an exchange, I right, just talk to your CPA before you close and make sure you know what that tax hit's going to be. Because if you sell and you think your tax hit's this big, if I sell today, I don't actually talk to my CPA about it until next year. Right. And that's when they tell me the news, hey, idiot, why didn't you call me? Right. You're not paying 15%, you're paying 23% or something. Right. So just know before you close. Um, but even that, some people will still say, no, I'm not going to do an exchange because in an exchange, are you eliminating the tax when you do a 1031? Deferring. Deferring the tax. Exactly correct. So that means you're kicking the can down the road. Right. So some tax advisors, and I get this all the time. By the way, I, I teach accredited courses for CPAs and attorneys, so I'm a free resource for your tax advisors too. Um, but I have tax advisors tell their clients, just pay the tax now, right? Because capital gains might be going up in the future and you're just deferring them to 1031, so just pay it now, right? Because we and we all believe that because we've all been patterned in our life to believe that two things in life are absolutely inevitable. What are they? Yeah. 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 You all knew it, right? Nothing taxes, right? Have we been lied to? Only one of those actually is. Which one? Wow. Good. 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 He's speaking next week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, no, yeah, of course, it's inevitable. Taxes are not. Right? Current estate tax law is incredibly favorable. Right? If you are single and your estate is below $11.5 million, there's no estate tax to your heirs. If you're married, it's double that, $23 million. No estate tax. And your heirs get a step up in basis. This is the this is the best part of that. So let's say um, I bought a property 50 years ago for 100 grand, and let's say I pass away yesterday, which makes this conversation. Uh, so, so I passed away yesterday, and the property is worth like two million dollars. I actually pass away, right? My kids, as soon as they go on title of the property after I pass away, their basis is stepped up from my old hundred thousand to the two million dollar current fair market value. That means they can immediately sell it after they inherit it and they don't need to do an exchange. It's a 100% tax free sale, right? Because their cost basis is 2 million and they're selling for 2 million. There's no gain, there's no profit, right? So that's why we say don't cash out of your real estate. Instead, just exchange into something else that better suits whatever your current financial objectives are. So I promise you, you know, as you grow in life, your objectives change. Right. And as you grow in life, if there is always a different type of real estate that will suit those objectives. So don't cash out. Instead, exchange, exchange, exchange until you die. die. Yes, we call it swap until you drop. Very good. trust. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So a trust is not a tax paying entity. Well, if it's irre irrevocable trust, is a revocable trust, which, you know, if you're alive, your trust is revocable, right? And that's the majority of trust for that. It's not a tax paying entity, right? Because a trust has nothing to do with taxation. A trust avoids probate, which in and of itself is a wonderful benefit. Anybody with any asset should have a trust. Um, once you die, if you decide your trust is going to go on and exist after you die, because you have young kids or something, well, then it becomes an entity. Then it becomes a tax paying entity. 
Um, so before you die, while the trust is revocable, it's not a taxpayer. So therefore you can sell as a trust and buy as an individual because it's the taxpayer inside the trust. It's the trustee of the taxpayer, right? Now, once it becomes irrevocable after you die and if the trust then sells, that trust has to buy. Uh, but yeah, putting it in and out of local trust, not a consequence for a temporary exchange, not at all. Um, so um, any questions on state tax or anything like that, or taxes in general before you pass it? No, cool. Let's talk just very quickly about kind of the, the basic rules of 1031, just we all know, because this is leading to one question you had, and that's the time frames of a 1031 exchange. Time frames of a 1031 exchange, you have 45 days to identify, 180 days to close. Those time periods begin when you actually close escrow on the relinquished property. Right? It doesn't actually start until it closes. Now we have to set up your exchange before you close escrow. Right? You can't call me the day after it closes and say, Russell, I'm ready to exchange. I've got my check from the title company right here. Yeah, that's called a fully taxable sale that cannot be turned into an exchange. So we can't even open your exchange officially until you've accepted an offer from a buyer and you've opened escrow. Right, and then, and then we just have to set up some time during escrow. It only takes like a day to set up the exchange. It's a really quick process. In the meantime, you can call me anytime. I mean, you can call me anytime with any questions. We don't officially open the exchange until you're in escrow. Now it closes, boom, that's starting your clock. You have 45 days to identify, 180 days to close. Those are concurrent time frames. Right, so after the 45th day, you have 135 left to close. Um, currently, um, if you know of anybody that are, you have friends that are California residents, but they buy and sell real estate here in Nevada, currently, Cali most of California is under a disaster relief extension um, because of the floods that happened back in early January. So their deadlines are October 16th currently. Um, so somebody in California, if they live in California, but they're selling Nevada properties, it matters, by the way, to get the extension, it's where you live that matters, not where the property is located. Um, so if they live in California, they're selling Nevada properties, they get the extension um, up to October 16th, uh, which is longer to identify, right? Once we hit September 1st, that goes away because then you're 45 days away from the October 16th deadline. Um, but everybody else has just 45 days to identify. That's the number one killer of exchanges, that rule, right? Because people wait until they close escrow on the relinquished property and they enter into that time period to begin the process of looking for properties. That is a bad strategy, right? When should you be looking for replacement properties? Now. Right now, right? Um, you, I, in an ideal world, you wanna be in contract on your replacement property prior to day zero, right? Prior to the closing of your relinquished property. Try to complete your exchange before the 45th day even passes. The reason why I say that is because prior to the 45th day, you can change your identification all you want. You can add and revoke. But as soon as midnight strikes on the 45th day, you are set in stone on only buying something you've identified. You can't substitute new properties after day 45, even if those properties are no longer for sale. It doesn't matter what's happened to them. You can't get more than 45 days. So it's crucial uh, to, to make sure you try to get into contract on your replacement property. Um, and then you got the total of the 100 days. By the way, both those dates are calendar days, not business days. So if a deadline falls on a weekend or a holiday, it's that day. You don't get the next business day extension. Any questions on time frames? No, let's talk about equal or greater value very quickly also. Because people ask me that question like, well, I'm selling for this much. I owe this much. Um, do I just have to reinvest the gain? Do I have to reinvest my proceeds? How much do I actually have to buy? It's actually pretty simple. So three things have to be equal greater if you don't want to pay any tax. All three of these things have to be equal greater. First is sales price. So if you sell for $800,000, you got to, well, you don't have to buy for 800. There's a little bit of a subtraction allowed. Um, Non-recurring closing costs, those one-time costs of sale get subtracted. Realtor commissions would be the biggest one. Time on escrow fees, transfer tax, those things all get subtracted. So if you sell for eight, Hundred and fifty thousand dollars with those costs. Seven fifty is the equal or greater mark you need to buy for. If you buy for less, you're just paying tax on the difference. You've done what we call a partial exchange. It doesn't blow the whole exchange. You still defer most of the tax, but you're going to pay a little bit of tax. So on the boot. On the exactly. That's what it's called. Boot, right? Strange term. Boot. 
Um, so the other thing that has to be or greater is the proceeds, right? So however much money comes out of the closing, all of that money must re be reinvested in the replacement property, right? Because some people will say, well, wait a minute, you know, I put hundred grand down on the property when I first bought it. That's part of my basis. Can't I really get that money back? That's not gain, all the referral, gain. You're trying to call that $100,000 you're taking out basis. The IRS is going to call it gain. Who wins? Mm -hmm. Yeah, IRS, right? Yeah, so the, the first dollar that you don't reinvest, they're going to call it taxable gain. They're not going to allow you to write it on its basis. Your basis is going to be fully transferred into the replacement property, right? Anything you touch or anything you buy down in is going to be taxed as gain. Right, so some people choose, they're like, okay, well, I still want to buy down. I don't mind paying a little bit of tax. Or they have a carry forward passive loss in their taxes, and they're going to finally be able to write it off against the meat. Okay, great. But just know whatever it is you're doing is going to be taxable if you buy it or less, or you touch any meat. The third thing that has to be more greater is debt. That one just kind of makes a math sense from a math standpoint, right? Because if you sell something for $500,000, $300,000, was with the equity proceeds, $200,000 was a mortgage that was paid off at closing. Right? So there's $300,000 in your exchange account. You find a $500,000 property because you need to buy it for equal greater value, and but you only have $300,000 to buy that property. How are you going to buy it? You're going to take on a new loan, right? The exception to that is you can replace debt with outside cash. So same scenario, sold for five, $200,000 was a mortgage paid off. There's $300,000 in your exchange. You found a $500,000 replacement property. It just so happens you have $200,000 of liquid cash in a bank account. Okay, you're going to bring that money in as additional down payment to buy your equal or greater $500,000 replacement property. You're buying it all cash. Fine. You replace debt with outside cash. No tax consequence. Right? To kind of simplify all that math, if you just look at two things, you'll never pay any tax. Buy and sell for equal or greater value and don't touch any money. If those two things happen, that math just all falls into place. Any questions on it? Is that a good play bringing in 200,000 from a different source? Because now you've tied that up into the 1031 world. Yeah. Too, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's not, now you've lost that liquid cash sure. into another world. You know? Sure. So whether or not it's a good play depends on your objectives, right? Yeah. Yeah, because there's no way for me to say it's a good, you know, it's a good play because it's personal. So if you don't want debt, if you're adverse to having debt, um, or if the debt is just too expensive now, and um, you know, you're earning one and a half percent on your money in the bank, and you're gonna avoid having to pay 7% on a loan, yeah, maybe it makes sense, right? To bring in the cash, because you're saving 7%. But then on the other hand, maybe you want the write-off of the interest deduction, and you wanna use that capital for something else. No right or wrong, just whatever works out best for you, whether or not it's a good thing. Right. You know, I'm, I don't want to make this about me, but I'm so in the middle of this right now. I'm sensing you do want to make oh, it about you. I, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm almost in a panic. I've got you know, my wife on one part of the, of, the, of the country looking at properties to right. obtain because I've got a buyer on the hook. Right. And he's 75000 above asking. Those. Well, there was no asking. Okay. Okay. He just wants the property. Okay. Gotcha. And it's like, I don't want to lose him. Right. And so I'm in that rush to identify another property. But you haven't closed yet, right? I haven't even got a I'm, I'm delaying yeah. going into contract. You shouldn't be in a rush. Um, get into contract. Get into contract. Tie him up. Uh, get into contract. But you know, he'd want to close immediately. Well, say, say and now 45 days would pressure me even more so. Okay, so tell you the fact that you're not getting into contract means he's not closing immediately anyway, right? So, I mean, you probably, right. have, you probably have explained your situation to them, but tell them, I'm doing an exchange. My wife is back east. She's looking at properties. Right. We need a 30-day escrow, right? And minimum. Minimum. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I'm saying, right? You can ask for more, right? But tie them up and get a 30-day escrow. You've just given yourself 30 extra days on top of the 45 to find some property, right? And don't close it unless you find something, if that's what you feel you need to do. And I better write that into the contract. You know, yeah, you can. You can write contingencies like that. You know, write it in something where it's sure just can't close. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've identified a property. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, time frames closed and done. Now, let's talk about the cool thing. And this is alluding to what you were in the back. What's your name? Lori. Lori. Lori, this is what Lori uh, brought up earlier. And that was talking about land 
you know, and buying some kind of improved property or whatever. So that really comes down to like kind, right? In the 1031 exchange, um, if you sell real estate and buy real estate, those two assets involved in that exchange have to be like kind with one another. So I'm going to throw out a question here. Um, who here, by a show of hands, has never been involved in an exchange yet? Okay, Lori, since this was your initial question, I'm going to ask you. Um, in the back there, you raised your hand. And you've never been to like a 1031 class before, have you? Have you done much studying about 1031? I just got my real estate license. Okay, cool. We're going to test you. you. <laughs> We're going to test you. By the way, thanks for volunteering. <laughs> uh, so, Lori, um, in an exchange, like I said, you can sell real estate, buy real estate um, for all tax. But the two properties involved in the exchange must be like kind with one another. So, Lori, let's say that you own um, five acres of land. It's like a building lot. It has no income coming off it. It never has. Um, and you'd like to sell that lot, and you'd like to buy this big commercial building. Would you say those two are like kind? I don't think they are. High Air 5. Okay. Amen, Amen. <laughs> You're 100% wrong. Thank you for playing. <laughs> uh, so the way you answer, Delori, is total common sense. Okay. Right? If I was not in the industry, I would answer exactly what she answered. And I'm a visual person. If you tell me something has to be like kind, and I'm selling land, I think I have to buy what? Land. land. If I'm selling a rental house, I've got to buy what? Rental house, commercial to commercial. Not the case. All real estate is like kind with all real estate. Excellent. It's not what the property looks like that makes it like kind. It's how it's treated. Mm -hmm. If a property is treated as business or investment, it's like kind with any other kind of business or investment purposes. The raw land even if it provides no income, you hold it for appreciation, which is a valid form of investment. Okay. Qualifies absolutely as like kind. So the raw land that um, Lori owns, the five acres, does she have any income? No, well, it depends on what she's growing. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you know, yes, it is. By the way, I need more brownies. She made really good brownies. Uh, so, so yeah, there's no income coming off it. Also, you can't depreciate all of it, right? Because there's no improvements on it. You can only depreciate improvements. So if you own raw land, then you have what we call stagnant equity, right? That land is worth $500,000. That's $500,000 not providing you with any income or depreciation. You can do an exchange. Or you can buy a rental house. Okay, now your $500,000 is producing cash flow. Now it's also providing you with depreciation to help negate the income tax due from the income on that asset. And in a lot of cases, it's a faster appreciating asset. You can do that all free using the 1031 exchange. So if you or anybody you know has land and they're just sitting on it, um, hey, you can do an exchange and do something else. Right? A lot of people hold land because they've inherited it, or they originally bought it cheap and they thought they were going to build on it, and they're not. But then if you say, hey, you should sell it, they're like, it's not costing me. I'm just going to keep it. That's an incorrect statement. It's costing you a lot in opportunity cost. And you have $500,000. It's not earning you any money at all or depreciation. Um, so it's all like kind. So if it's all like kind, why even have that term like kind? Hmm. People used to trade like cars for land or art for cars or you're half right. Um, we did used to do exchanges on those asset classes. We used to be able to do exchanges on all kinds of personal property, right? which is what you're describing. Um, so yeah, you can exchange you know, boats, planes, tractors, arts and collectibles, which you described also, um, livestock. They were all exchangeable. The Jobs Act, and that was previously, right? The Jobs Act in 2017 changed 1031 forever. And it eliminated all personal property type exchanges. Now it's just real estate in 1031. But back then, when you're talking about personal property, like kind was very specific, right? You could not exchange a boat for a plane. It had to be a plane for a plane, a boat for a boat. Um, you couldn't intermix those. Um, so, but now it's just real estate. Now it's just real estate. Um, but there are a couple of types of real estate that are not like kind. Um, one is a personal use one. Your primary residence. That's a personal use property. For 1031 purposes, your intent must be to hold for business or investment purposes, for personal use. Right? So your primary residence doesn't qualify 1031, which is fine, right? Because you already have a phenomenal tax benefit when you sell your primary. Right? Because if you've lived in it for two out of the last five years, 
you get to use another section code of the IRX, and that's section code 121. That's the primary residence capital gains due. So as you get, if you've been in it for two out of five years, you get to exclude a little bit. So um, do we have any single people in the room? How much do our single people get? $250,000. Do we have any married guys in the room? How much do you get? $500. No, I get two. Your I wife gets five hundred. You're just going to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> She's on the East Coast right now, spending it. <laughs> you know, so I gave her a budget, and she's already three times over. <laughs> Hello, and you're going to say that's okay, dear, because you believe in four words: happy wife, happy life. Uh, <laughs> good man. So, uh, yeah, sorry. Can you make the part of your assessment? Yeah. Like if the replacement property is a property that you then move into as a primary. We're going to talk about that in just a second. We're going to talk. I'll absolutely walk you through how to do that. Um, so. Because of that wonderful exclusion with Section 121, yeah, nobody really wants to do an exchange on their primary anyway. That was tax-free money. By the way, that is tax-free money. In a primary residence, when you sell it, if you sell it under Section 121, you can take that exclusion once every two years. You can literally sell a primary residence every two years to pay new tax. It's not a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Um, and also, you don't have to buy another primary. It's not a rollover. It's just tax-free money which is cool. It replaced what I used to do when I was younger, and that was the 1034 exchange on the primary residence. And that was where you had two years either before or after the sale of your primary residence to buy another primary residence, and you were just deferring the tax, right? And that was eliminated in 1997, and now this section 121 came into play, and it's far superior. It was just tax-free money, right? Um, and because of that, nobody wants to sell a primary anyway. But exactly your scenario, a ton of people, would love to, man, I own a couple of rental properties or a piece of land, and I'd like to take all of that money and use it to buy my dream home, right? Well, that's personally used property. I can't do it with a 1031. But what I can do is go through a conversion process. The IRS created your dream scenario um, back in 2008. It's a revenue procedure. The revenue procedure is 2008-16. And it is actually a safe harbor revenue procedure. They rarely, the IRS rarely titles anything safe harbor. Because if they do, that means if you follow their guidelines, you are safe from them, which they normally don't like us to feel. Right? Um, if you follow these guidelines, you can't, your exchange can't be challenged, can't be overturned. Right? So here's the guidelines. Sell your investment properties that you would have gotten killed in taxes. If you just did, sold it out, you don't have to pay any taxes. Do a 1031, buy your very expensive dream property, all cash. Here's what you need to do for the first two years. This is the time period. For the first two years after the exchange, you have to treat that property two ways. You have to do both of these things in the first two years. One is you have to limit your personal use to two weeks a year or less, or 10% of the rental history, whichever is a greater number. Right, so if you rented it on Airbnb for like 300 days a year, you could use it personally for 30 days. Now, also, um, keep in mind, if I'm going there to like, you know, work on it, mow the lawn or something, is that a personal use visit? No, it's a maintenance visit. So there's, legally, there are ways to use it for more than two weeks here. But nevertheless, that's the first thing to do is limit my personal use. Second thing I have to do is I have to show income on it. That's a crazy low standard. I only have to show two weeks per year of income on it. That's it. So if it's truly a dream home scenario, what is the last thing you want in your dream home? People. People. <laughs> People, right? tenants or whatever, right? So this is a way where you can sell investment properties, not have to pay a dime in taxes, take all that cash to buy your very expensive dream. And all you have to do is limit your personal visits for the first two years and find a buddy to rent it to for two weeks a year and claim that on my taxes. After two years, guess what I get to do? Whatever I want, I can move into it as a primary. I can treat it as a pure second home or vacation. I never have to rent it again. And the IRS can't challenge my exchange. It's a safe harbor. That is fantastic. Yes. There's one third thing that you need to do during that two years. Okay. And that is do all the improvements that you want to do for yourself while it's still a rental and you can write them off. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Good point. So, and it depends on now, but. So you said you stated a certain word, though. you said improvement, right? So 
how, whatever you do to your investment property, you're going to have a tax benefit in one of two ways, right? If it's a repair, which is the smaller ticket items, right? Then you get a write off 100% of that expense in that year against the income, right? But if it's an improvement, that's the word you said. If it's an improvement, that's a bigger ticket item. Roof, remodel, deck, things like that, right? Bigger ticket items, improvements add the basis and get depreciated, right? So you get the tax, you only get the tax benefit, you get 127th of it, you know, for as long as you have it in rental service. As soon as you move into it, you don't take depreciation, right? So yeah, there, I mean, so, but it just depends on what you're doing with the improvements or repairs. We have. Good point there. So any questions on the whole conversion of primary residence? That's you say you only had to rent it for two weeks. Two weeks a year, each of the first two years. And then, and then two out of the five. Mm -hmm. Two out of the, no, 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 two out of five is your primary residence thing, right? This is just the first two years after the exchange, you have to treat it as a business use property first. And that's what they define the IRS as a business use property is limiting your personal use and renting it for at least two weeks a year. That defines business use in their eyes. If you could post like uh, a retreat, a business, a business retreat at it too. Like that's a business use. I think a lot of people might think, oh, I have to rent it out to somebody. Sure. But you could just host people for a business retreat, whatever that means. Yeah, and you... 1031 lunch. And then, yeah, <laughs> I, but it's it's real flexible in that business use. Sure. What is your name? Mitch. Mitch. Yeah, Mitch. I like your creative thinking. Um, but I would ask you to defer all of your tax fraud questions to your own CPA. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm just joking. But yeah, you're right. Right. If you have a business use on it and your CPA is cool, yeah, absolutely. Then you want to do some retreat and you want to expense it out. Go for it. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's a minimal amount you have to claim on, right? That two weeks a year. It's pretty easy to establish the two to get over that threshold. Can you just do that for the first two years? And you're golden. After two years, you can do whatever you want. You can move into it as a primary residence. So that's that's super cool. No, yes. When you talk about the conversion, is there any special process you go through with the IRS or mm -hmm. any just the only yeah, there's no you don't have to claim to the IRS, hey, we changed it. It's just they'll automatically know because it's in your tax records, right? Because you're no longer doing a Schedule E on it. It's no longer a rental property. That's your primary. So you're no longer claiming it on your taxes as an income property. And now it's your, you know, it's your mailing address, your primary residence. So no, there's no notice given to the IRS. There's no, and it doesn't trigger any kind of tax. Right? Taxes are never triggered. What's that? We do appreciation and we sell it as your primary. Oh, good point. Um, so so let's say, well, actually, let me just clarify your question. Are you saying we did this scenario? Yes. And then moved into it. Yes. And then eventually want to sell as my primary. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is going to get a little complicated. Um, if you sell, if you do this conversion, if you sell and then you buy it and then you, you know, rent it out and then you move into it, and then you want to sell it eventually as your primary and you don't want to do it exchange, right? You're going to get a prorated share of the capital gain. It's not just all, you don't just automatically get your 500,000 or your 250,000. It won't work that way. So first of all, before you can sell that property under section 121 as your home and try to eliminate a lot of that tax, you have to own it for a minimum of five years. It's only because you bought it with an exchange. You can still buy and sell your primary residence every two years. But if you buy something with an exchange, you defer tax into it. And now you want to sell it and eliminate some of that tax. You have to own it for a minimum of five before you can claim 121, okay? So now let's say, let's say, um, let's say I buy it and I rent it for three, and then I move into it and I live in it for three, and then I sell it, so I've owned it for six. So what happens is when I sell it, I have to look back on each of those six years and define them into one of two categories, either a qualified or a non-qualified. I'm trying to sell it and eliminate a lot of the tax, so a qualified year is a year I actually live in it. Non-qualified year, it was either vacant or rented, right? So in my in my six years, that's 50-50, right? So I, I have a, I get so I get to exclude fifty percent of the gain up to my five hundred thousand. So if I had a um, million dollars of actual gain, remember I've got old gain that I deferred into it, but then I've owned it for six years, so I probably have some new gain. So my total gain, if that was a million dollars, then I would still get my five hundred thousand. I just pay tax on the other five because so I was in excess of that, right? But if I only had six hundred thousand dollars of total gain, I don't get to pluck out five hundred thousand. I only get to pluck out three. 
I pay tax on my gas. That proration works better the longer I own the property and live in. Right, so if I own it for 10 years and I lived in it for eight and then sold it, I get 80% of the gain. Right, but there's never a point, let me make this clear, there's never a point when you can sell that primary and eliminate 100% of the tax. It's physically impossible. You can eliminate a lot of the tax, just not all of it. And your specific question was depreciation. So section 121 is an exclusion of capital gain. It is not an exclusion of recapture of depreciation. So whatever, if you convert something to a primary and sell it, even if you have very little gain, you're going to pay all of the depreciation and capture. It's not forgiven through Section 121. This is also true, forget about the exchange. Let's just say the house you now live in, you didn't exchange into it, but let's say you sell it and you're within your 500000 So you think, oh, I'm going to have a tax-free sale. Maybe not. Did you have any kind of business use in your house? Do you claim an in-home office? If you do, you're taking depreciation. Do you rent out the ADU in the backyard? Okay, that's an, you run out of bedroom on Airbnb. Any of those are business uses, which means you're taking depreciation. Depreciation is recaptured when you sell it under section 121. The only way to eliminate depreciation is to do a temporary exchange and to defer it in the next property. So if you do that with your house, let's say you depreciate um, a bedroom in your house and now you're going to sell it. And your CPA says you're going to pay 10 grand in depreciation recapture. And you don't want to pay 10 grand. You have the option to do an exchange. It's what we call a mixed use exchange. Part of the property is personal use, part of the property is business use. So the part that is personal use is sheltered under 121. The business use part, you get a tenth of a year. So if you depreciate 10% of your house, 90% of the sale will come to you tax free at closing. The other 10% of the sale needs to flow through a 1031 exchange if you don't want to pay tax. A more simple example of that would be like if you live in a duplex, you live in half, you rent out half. Well, it's a mixed use property. When you sell it, half that sale can come to you tax free. The other half needs to flow through an exchange. So you get to eliminate tax and defer the rest in a mixed use exchange. It's kind of cool. So, any questions on the primary business? No? Let's get past that. Now, let's talk about the other type of real estate that is not exchangeable. I got, I got a quick one. Sure. Um, it's the continued drama. Okay. <laughs> I get a call from the wife today. She's located a fabulous lakefront home, but the people don't want to sell it for another year or so. Okay. And I said, great, get it under contract and let's work out some sort of a lease back deal. Yeah, lease option or something. For the next year or so. Sure. You know, they'll go for that and that would get us to the two year mark. Yeah. Well, two year mark. What do you well, mean? I mean, get. So we're into that. So I can do a 1031 exchange into that property. Two-year mark. The only two-year mark would be for like converting to a primary residence. Well, I want to, we want to convert that to a primary. So the two-year mark does not start until you actually close on that property and you own it. If you do a lease option, you don't own it. That doesn't right. your ownership. So that's not going to go with part of it. That will that well, will, I would be an I would owner. I own it and then come back. Rent back. Yeah. Like a rent back, yeah. You'd be the lessee. Because no, 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 they're going to stay in the home. Uh, okay, so okay. as a renter, so you're talking about buying it from them and then buying it from them and leaving them okay, in well, there. That yeah, some special deal. Yeah, yeah, they want to stay in it for a year. Yeah, so then yeah, you do the exchange now, sell your property, buy that one, right. and then they would be your tenant for the year. But I need another year out of it, don't I? For what? So then you need two out of the five. Yeah, but no, okay, that, but that's one year, right? Yeah. And then for another year, rent to somebody else. And we're just rent it for two weeks and leave it vacant the rest of the year and then move into it. So if I just did that year with them and then just rent it for two more weeks, I could move in. I'm not telling you that. <laughs> I mean, you're hearing different things than what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, it's all right. I can't say a personal residence. You know? Yeah, it won't be that one. It shouldn't be that one, right? Uh, for the first two years, you shouldn't live in it for the first two years. Okay. Now, what you actually do is between you and your CPA. I got it. Right. Got it. I'm just telling you the same thing. But I need to get part of that second year rent. Right? You need to rent it for, well, so you don't have then to. Then I just live in a fuel box somewhere. You don't have to. You don't have to. Yes, <laughs> you don't have to rent it for the full second year. Right. You rent for two weeks, but you two can't weeks. live in it for that second. Year. Right, so it have to be vacant. Oh no, I'd never live there. <laughs> <laughs> I just take the money. 
I will not be involved as a that was never my I will never be your co defendant. So we're good. Yes, yes, Mitch. Do you have to own it for 24 months or have it in your taxes for two years? Well, so you're saying either I think if you bought it in July. Yeah. The code, the the the, the does it say 24 months? The safe harbor, the safe harbor says 24 months. Oh, yeah. uh, although I see a lot of CPAs do their interpretation of that and say two tax returns. Yeah. So once again, I can say the safe harbor. It's up to you guys to follow it or not. Yeah, because your CPA is going to possibly tell you something different because they're going to say, like, you're not going to get audited because we claimed income on it for half that year. So on paper, it still looks like an income full year. We're not, we didn't write that's your primary residence. But that's between you and your CPA, right? I just tell you the same It's up to you guys. And if you guys want a good tax fraud advisor, sounds like Mitch Hazard. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Yes. Yeah. This is a good example of what I was wondering of how. If at all, can we use 1031 exchange in more creative aspects of so the fact that uh, you have potential lease option deal in the works? The 1031 could interface with that. So, so a lease option would be um, that's that's not this example, right? Yeah. But a lease option is um, something that can be used to benefit an exchanger. So, like for example, like if I need more time, I'm afraid of the 45, 180 days, right? Um, so let's say that um, the property that um, I'm buying is being built and it's not going to be ready for another eight months. Okay, well, I can't sell my relinquished property because all, all that's way longer than 180 days. So my buyer says, I want to buy your property. Great. Let's agree to terms now. Let's do a lease option. So that way you'll have control of the asset, my property too. You'll be able to move into it or do whatever you want with it. And it's because an option is not a transfer of ownership. The benefits and burdens of ownership are not transferred. So it doesn't trigger any time frames in an exchange. So then you let them take control of that property. They give you some option money. And boom, six months later, you're ready to close on this one. So you say, okay, now we'll exercise the option and I'll sell you. Right? Uh, same thing on your, on your buy-in. Right? If you need to do a lease option, if you need more time to sell, but you found what you love, and you want to tie it up, you can do a lease option. On it, right? To give you time to get your property sold, that's going to take a lot longer. So lease option can be used very creatively to give you more time in a 1031 exchange if needed. Well, can you 1031 exchange into a opportunity fund? Opportunity zone, you cannot. Um, in an opportunity zone fund, um, you are not buying fee simple ownership in the real estate. You're buying into a partnership, right? You're buying stock. Um, and it's not like kind of real property. Um, people do use the opportunity zone fund sometimes like if they fail their exchange, right? And they'll go ahead and invest the capital gain. It's very different, right? Opportunity zone fund is very different. Than, um, than 1031. 1031 is forever referral. Opportunity zone fund is very short referral. Right? It's only until 27. Um, and then you're going to be paying at least like 90% of your tax in that time period. Um, but you get to defer, if you're in it for 10 years, you get to defer the gain, the profit from that asset, right? Forever. Uh, it's forgiven, which is great. Um, I, yeah, the ozones are great, um, but I think they're better suited for if you have like gain. From something that's not real estate, you're selling stock or a business, you know, goodwill or something, and you have gain in that. Well, you have no shelter with 1031. So, opportunity zone fund is fantastic to go into because at least you get some shelter. Or if you're selling a primary residence and you're blowing way past your 250 or 500,000, hey, put the extra gain into the ozone. You'll get some deferral on it. But, not, but it's not 1031. Good question. So, um, we pretty much finished out the whole prime mixed use thing, primary residence thing. Yes. Uh, are ticks still out there or ticks. did they all die? <laughs> the ticks and fleas died. Uh, so, no, the, the, the ticks are still out there to some extent, but it's been replaced by the DST, um, the Delaware Statutory Trust. Actually, we should talk about that right now. Um, so, well, you know what? Let me do one other thing first. And let's just talk about this because 1031 is federal, which means and all states recognize the 10th of exchange. So you can move markets with a 10th As you know, you can sell in California and buy in Nevada. You've seen a lot of people do it. Um, yes. Does that include territory? Pardon? Does that include US territory? Some US territories. Uh, so US Virgin Islands and Guam. Uh, you cannot exchange into Puerto Rico. I have that bummer. So unfortunately, but the other ones, but the other ones you can. So you can exchange. Domestic for domestic or foreign for foreign, but you can't mix the two. So as a U.S. taxpayer, I can sell my property in 
Canada and buy a property in Mexico and avoid U.S. tax. I want to avoid taxes in those countries where I'm selling, and I will avoid U.S. tax. I can't mix the two. Though. I can't sell U.S. and buy foreign and switch them. Um, but that's great. I mean, if you're thinking of retiring in another state or buying a second home or vacation home somewhere, use the 1031, right, to reposition into that state. Uh, you can sell, like, one property here and buy, like, half of North Carolina. Very cool. Uh, so if you want a vacation or a second home in another state, because then you're thinking of maybe moving there or talking there or whatever, fantastic. And you can do it in the exchange. And one thing you have to look at in California, um, if we have, and you guys will be familiar with this, if we have any previous Californians that left the state of California with a 1031 exchange, the California is one of the four states that has a very unique provision. Um, the Franchise Tax Board in California, as you know, is the most aggressive tax collection agency in the entire universe. Um, taxes are stupid and insane in that state. Um, but here, they have a clawback provision. So the state recognizes, that California recognizes the 1031. So you can sell in California and buy into that. But if your thought process is, I'm going to sell my property in California, I'm going to move to Nevada to a non-tax state, and I'm eventually going to sell my property in Nevada, just pay the tax. I'll only have to pay feds because Nevada doesn't have a state tax. You are incorrupt um, because California is a clawback. So when you sell in California and buy in another state like Nevada and then become a resident of that state, so you're no longer a California resident, then you have to file a one-page supplemental return every single year in the state of California. It's easy to do, but you have to tell California every year at tax time, I didn't sell the property. Because wow. the year you sell the property, you're going to owe California the tax. You left the state. Wow. Yeah. If you never, if you never cash out, which means if you sell the Nevada property and do another 1031 into Tennessee, right, you will continue to defer the tax. California will not collect the tax. And then, of course, if you die, the tax is forgiven. So if you want to stick it to California, die. <laughs> Teach you, Governor Newsom. So that's crazy. That's crazy. Yep. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yep, you know, tax. Your areas they wouldn't have any tax, so California would not collect in that state. But they're only they're one of four states, right? Oregon, Montana, and um, I think Connecticut is the fourth one. All four of those states have a clawback provision. Um, so yeah, interesting. Any questions on that taxation? No. Uh, so the last thing I want to talk about, and that's what we've been waiting for this whole time, and that is what I consider like the exit strategy, which is exactly what you're alluding to. You know, I've owned rental properties my whole life, single family rental properties, right? I bought my first rental property, you know, when I'm in my 20s. And because somebody said buy real estate is good investment because a fixer upper, after two or three years, got some nice sweat equity in the property, maybe 50, 60 grand, grand of newfound equity, and maybe it's making a little positive cash flow. So I'm like, hey, this is cool. Let's do it again. Buy another one, and another one, and another one. Uh, it's a side hustle, do something else for a living. I'm a teacher, I'm a fireman, something like that, right? Um, but now I am a retirement age and I own five, 10, 20 rental properties and I own them all free and clear, right? So when I first got investing in real estate, I was young. What was my primary financial objective in life back then? Money. Money. More specifically, growing money, right? Building wealth. Pure ending real estate. Appreciation. <laughs> Appreciation, right? I wanted to grow my wealth. Uh, so is the, is the primary financial objective of single family rental properties, is it cash flow or appreciation? Yes. Appreciation. <laughs> it is appreciation. You're 100% correct. It is not cash flow. Cash flow is a consideration, right? You have to get X amount of cash flow to keep the property. It needs to be a consideration. But it is not the primary financial objective of that asset class. It's appreciation, right? So, and, and it is, that asset class is one of the best ways to build long-term for appreciation. Fantastic way. Buy and hold single family. Fantastic way to build long-term. That was my objective back then. I'm now a retirement age. I have a ton of equity now, and I'm a retirement age. What's my primary financial objective in life now? Cash flow. Cash flow. It's not appreciation anymore. Cash flow. It's cash flow, right? Because in fact, I want preservation of capital and I don't want to lose any equity that I built up over the years and I want to maximize the monthly income. Okay, well, if that's the case, you shouldn't own a single family. If your primary financial objective in life is, is, is cash flow, you should not own a single family. 
other types of real estate are designed for cash flow. That's in the commercial. Right, so commercial, industrial, you know, mini storage, you know, multifamily apartment complexes, those are designed for cash flow. Those provide better cash flow. And then on top of that, the next objective beyond cash flow is passiveness. That's what you were alluding to. And I don't want the headaches of real estate anymore, especially just coming off of COVID and not being able to evict tenants. And now all of a sudden you're, you're like, oh man, I'm finally going to evict the tenants now. I've lost a lot of income. They didn't have to pay. And now I have to spend 40 grand to put this back in the service. So I'm going to just put this back in the service. Maybe you have another rental property. Why? Why would you do that? At your retirement age now, get the heck out of those assets, go into commercial. Um, and if you want to go, you know, passive, you go into commercial triple net lease. And that's a very passive form of ownership. But here's the problem. This person I'm describing to you is only on a single family board. I'm not familiar with commercial. I'm not comfortable. They're very comfortable buying single family, owning it, and managing it. But they're not comfortable with commercial. But, they, but yet they need to pin it to that if they want to achieve their objectives. So then the dilemma is, well, I don't want to buy my own commercial properties. I'm not familiar with that. I'm not comfortable with it. And that's where the DST comes into play. Um, there's already uh, suitable replacement properties that are ready made for 1031 exchangers to go passive. What I'm about to describe to you, this DST, which stands for Delaware, like the state, Delaware Statutory Trust, this type of asset class was approved by the IRS as like-kind replacement property for 1031 purposes back in 2004. So there's actually there's over 20 years of history in our industry because it's been around longer than it was approved. Um, but it is a form of replacement property in a 1031 exchange. Um, and what you do when you buy into a DST, you're buying a fractional ownership interest in an institutional grade asset. What I mean by institutional grade asset, it's a, it's a 90, 100, $120 million class A asset somewhere in the country. Right? They're called institutional grade because in the past, only institutions could afford to buy and own these kinds of properties, like REITs, insurance companies, things like that. Now, because of this structure, with the DST, the small time investor selling a $400,000 rental property can actually invest in an institutional grade asset and reap those kinds of passive benefits. They are 100% passive, right? All we call it mailbox, even though it works digital now, so that's not really true. Um, all you do, you have zero as an owner, zero duties and responsibilities. You just receive monthly income into your bank account automatically every single month. Can't wait. And you can't, you can never be asked for cash calls. This is huge, right? Because you're tired of real estate for a lot of, you don't want to deal with the tenants, right? And all the headaches, right? Okay, that's great. Have somebody professionally manage it. Well, even if you have somebody manage your rental properties, you're still the owner. So when the roof gets replaced, who's getting the call? I am the owner, right? I've got to come out of pocket for all those expenses. Not a DST. Anything has any repairs that have to be done to these assets are paid for through the fund of the management asset, uh, the asset manager. The investors can never be asked for a penny of cash call or anything during the whole period, which is huge. So, that, so it is truly 100% passive. Um, now, these properties, uh, you should not buy into a DST if you're thinking, hey, I'm just going to buy it for like a year and then I'm going to do something else. You need to think that you're going into it for its life cycle. Its life cycle on average is about four to six years. I've seen them sell less than that, but that's what you got to kind of think is I'm going to be in it for four to six. Because when it, when the market's right to sell that asset, the managing company is going to sell it. And then they tell you, hey, we just accepted an offer. And it's going to be closing in like 60 days. So you have 60 days as an owner to decide what do you want to do? Are you going to 1031 with them into the next DST because you love that passive structure? Or are you going to 1031 out and buy property, traditional real estate back in Reno? Or I'm just going to pay your tax. It's just another exchange opportunity for themselves. So you have all the options. That, yes, Larry. What's the minimum to invest in? Hundred thousand typically. Hundred thousand typically, and that's and that, I don't recommend that asset class as you know if you just have a hundred thousand dollars in total to because if if you have a hundred thousand dollars, your primary financial objective with that could still be kind of appreciation, right? Because cash flow can be kind of minimal, so you should still try to grow that, right? But where it is useful for $100,000 in a 1031 exchange is what I call is acting like a sponge. So in a 1031, let's say you sold for $2 million and then you found traditional real estate for 1.7. You've got $300,000, you still need to buy something. What are you gonna do with it? 
I don't want to buy another piece of real estate. Great, plug it into the BST for 100000 right? That way, you don't have to pay tax. Right? And it'll sit there and earn you income, right? Another thing we see the 1031 used for before the pandemic, the, by far the number one reason why people went into BST is because they wanted to retire from active real estate and just go 100% passive, right? Since the pandemic, we had this crazy low inventory market, which we're still kind of in. Um, and so when it's a low inventory market, exchanges fail at a higher percentage because of that 45 day rule. Right? You're trying to find properties, you're writing offers, but you're competing with 20 people every time and you're losing out every time you write an offer. And then you get to day 40 and you're like, we haven't gotten into contract on anything. So to heck with that, let's just plug it into a BST. And then we'll just let it sit right out for four to six years, see what's going on in the market four to six years, no one sells. And then we'll come back out and buy traditional real estate because there's always EST inventory available, always. And it's like a five day close. It's a cookie cutter deal from a 1031 standpoint. So a lot of people use them as backup properties or as an actual you know, default strategy to go into. Yes. Uh, do the DSTs use leverage or is it just an all cash deal? Most are leveraged. Um, so the sponsor company buys the asset themselves first before any investors come in. And they typically come in with 50% down payment. And so they get a loan on the rest. Um, there are exceptions to that, right? Because remember the DST was actually created for 1031 purposes. Right, so they create all these different DSTs to satisfy exchangers. Most exchangers need to replace some kind of debt. So this 50% works really good. So if you're coming in with $500,000 of cash into your DST, you're buying a million dollar slice of that DST. And that's what your income is going to be based on. That's what your depreciation is going to be based on, like a million dollars. Um, and then you know, you're going to earn cash on cash based on the $500,000. Um, but they, if you have to replace debt, it's a cookie cutter because you're not qualifying for the debt. You don't have to fill a loan application, but yeah, you automatically assume it, and it's non-recourse financing, and it's not on your credit. Report. So it's it's from a tender standpoint, the debt replacement is fantastic. Um, but some of them, if you just want to be all cash, if you don't want to have any debt on the asset, um, then there are DSTs that are all cash. Some exchangers also are selling properties with a much higher debt ratio. Right, they're like 80% debt, 20% proceeds, but they need to exchange because they pulled cash out while they own the property. But they want to sell and they don't, because even though they get this amount of money, they pay tax on all of it, right? So they also have some highly leveraged DSTs for those people, right? But the vast majority of 50% leverage. Is it treated as a partnership? No, it is not, because you can't exchange into a partnership with um, It is not. It is a, it's a trust, and you're buying an interest in the trust. It is considered fee simple real estate. Um, which is very good. It does withstand the like kind muster. So you share in that depreciation also. Yeah, you get your so it's real estate. So you know you get you have all the benefits of real estate. Right? You're you're receiving the income, but then you're also able to take the depreciation. And the nice thing about this is an example of a leverage DST, fifty percent, right? Let's say the property you sold had no debt on it, and it was a five hundred thousand dollar property. And you had fully depreciated, right? That means if you go out and buy another five hundred thousand dollars property, you you have your old basis came with you. You have no new depreciation to take. But if you buy a more expensive property, the amount you bought in excess of what you sold for is brand new depreciation, a brand new basis. So therefore, if you sold all cash for five hundred thousand dollars, an asset that was fully depreciated, and you buy with that five hundred thousand dollars cash into a DST, you're buying a million dollars worth of DST, which means you have $500,000 of brand new depreciation to start taking. So yeah, it's a great benefit to it. Yes. What's the cash flow like with a say $500,000 DST as opposed to like a uh, duplex or triplex or something? It varies, right? So these assets are regulated through the Securities and Exchange Commission. So they're sold to securities brokers. So you have to sit down with an actual licensed broker that deals in DSTs. Um, and then at, at that time, they would say, okay, here's the 30 or 40 different offerings that are open right now in the country. And they all have kind of different returns, right? Traditional real estate, you know, like this commercial building, right? Would be like probably in the four to five cap rate. Um, and that's cash on cash. Forgive me, it's not cap rate, it's cash on cash, right? So if you're putting in $500,000, you expect, you know, four to 6% in actual cash flow off the property after expenses are paid debt. Management all that stuff, right? 
Um, and then um, there's other types of properties though, besides traditional real estate. Because you can exchange in anything that's a real property right. So there's oil and gas leases. You can exchange into a DST that's based on oil and gas leases. So you don't own any real property, but you own the production of that oil and gas lease. And so, and that's exchangeable. And those things pay like right currently like 10 to 12%. So there's uh, there's different, you know, you sit down with a straight book and say, okay, well, I want a little more return here, taking a little more risk here, but I want to stand for real estate here. And the you pick and choose, right? Uh, but it varies, right? And so cap rates have been going up the last couple of years since the pandemic, because whenever there's an insane appreciation cycle, that makes cap rates plummet, right? Well, now we're in that opposite curve of cap rates are starting to rise a little bit more uh, sectors. Still, self storage 13.95, industrials 5.56, multifamily 11.6. As an example, of there you go. There you go. Can you use a self directed hierarchy? Sure, you can. Um, it wouldn't be a 10 to 1. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely use a self directed IRA to go because the, the IRA itself is the is the tax deferral vehicle, so you don't need 10 to 1. But yeah, sure, you can invest in real estate self directed IRA. Absolutely. So any other questions on the DST? What do you think that you say? <laughs> Great question. Sketchy, you know. No. So the thing, because what, what you're really asking is what's the risk, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm like your story. It's always been single family homes. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I mean, I can whip a garbage disposal in now in about 20 minutes. And, sure. Because you know, I've done so many. Right. Right. But, which, by the way, means now I'm going to call you when I have one. <laughs> yeah. And let me tell you, laying on my back under a single yeah. days are ending. You know? yeah, yeah, absolutely. But shoveling snow. Yes. But, um, you know, the DSC, to me, it's a whole scary venture. Well, so it's scary because you're not familiar with it. Exactly. So that's exactly. So, but here's the thing. Um, it's real estate. You're buying real estate. So it has all the risks of real estate. But you know what? You already own real estate. You already live in that risk world. But the thing I like about it from a risk profile, just personally, um, is that I think somebody going, somebody has only had single family to hold those rental properties. And now they need to pivot to commercial because that's going to better suit their financial objectives. I think it's risky for that person to go out and buy their own piece of commercial real estate and own it by themselves because right. they don't know what they're buying, they don't know how to manage it, right? In this scenario, in the DST, you get to hit your wagon to the largest buyers and managers of commercial real estate in the country. And it's regulated by the SEC, but it's very transparent, right? You'll get a prospectus on whatever, whatever property you're looking at. You're right. going to get a prospectus on that sponsor company. And you'll be able to see every property they've ever bought and sold and managed and how they did, even through the Great Recession. So if you're going to pick a company like, hey, they've been around 40 years. They never lost anything during the Great Recession. I like those guys. Right, right, right. Any, these particular buildings are Amazon distribution. Yeah, yes. How are you going to go wrong with that? Yeah. You know, I mean, are we say that, not yeah, going to overnight delivery? I mean, is that going to end for people? I don't think Yeah. So. No, agreed. Yeah. yeah. So there's always risk. You will yeah. never be able to, just more you'll the never process. be able to invest in real estate that doesn't have risk. Right. Right. Or so, anything else. So really, it's just what's your comfort level. Right. And, and so, but I, like I said, I like to do my due diligence. And I'm, this is very transparent. So I see who I'm investing with, you know, who I'm following. Right. And, and I feel very good about that. And the company right. that's guiding me that way has heavily vetted yeah. that, that particular job. Absolutely. Because yeah. that's their job. There's several layers of right. due, due diligence, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, with this format, is this the most like authentication? Like you get paid out like a K1 kind of setup. If I do, because you mentioned that you get to take part in the depreciation aspect as well. So yeah. Or is it something that's like, because uh, you mentioned like a REIT, like mm -hmm. you would buy on the stock market. Mm -hmm. So you would get to partake in uh, the active depreciation of the um, property at the time. You can't buy, I mean, it feels like a syndication, the DSI. Okay. It okay. feels like a REIT just because it's passive, right? But it's not. You can't exchange into a syndication. You can't exchange into a REIT because when you buy into those assets, you are not buying ownership in the real estate, which is what you have to do for tens of purposes. You're buying stock or shares, right? And that's not like kind. That's not exchangeable. Right? This is exchangeable. This is fee simple ownership. You are buying into the real estate as an owner in the real property. You're not buying into a partnership. Yeah. Yes. 
on the PST, um, who advises or tracks those opportunities, like you know, financial advisors, financial advisor, a, a obviously. What was the name? Financial advisor. Well, not realtors, um, because these are licensed through the SEC. So to sell these assets, you have to be securities licensed, right? So, well, what you want to do is you actually want to use a broker that specializes in DST, right? If it's your Edward Jones guy, you know, and he does stock, and he'll do this on the side. I don't recommend using that person because you want somebody intimately familiar with all of the different sponsor companies that are out there. Right, because you want them to pick and choose the best ones for you, right? Not somebody, not a company that's just paying the highest commission. You want them to choose the best asset for you. And that might mean a company that's been around for 40 years, right? Maybe it's a little less return, but man, it's so better for you, right? So, so go through a, a securities broker that actually deals in DST. You can Google DST broker and that's they're, they're, they're out there. They're, they're out there. You'll be inundated. You'll be inundated. Or you can, you can also text or call me. I'll gladly refer you to people that I have known and work with too. Either way is fine. Either way, it's fine. Any other questions? Actually, we're kind of getting close for a time anyway. Do you guys have any other just questions in general? Is anybody still awake? <laughs> I the first one. I buy coffee still. Yes. So, are you an intermediate media? Yeah, we're the largest in the nation. It's all we do is Amazon. Our closest competitor does less than 50% of the volume we do nationwide. So, so we you for this exchange. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, call me. Yeah, we can get it set up in a couple hours. Do you have What's that? My yeah, cell phone. It's on the brochure. It's on the brochure. <laughs> yeah. And you can go ahead and call me nine o'clock tonight. We'll answer. It's all good. I'm I'm waiting by my phone every night to put a bucket of popcorn. <laughs> waiting. <laughs> Have you done a lot of the DST stuff? Oh, a ton. Yeah, I do thousands of exchanges, right? So I've done. I, I can't count them. And we've been doing them since before 2004. When they were approved. So there's a long history of DSTs in the industry. There are intermediaries. Uh, Percentage fee based type. Oh, thing. you know, great question. We didn't talk about that. So just very quickly, because um, that's important. Um, so you guys are to put you on the spot. No, 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 this is good. I'm really glad you brought it up. So I'm gonna throw out a question to you guys. You can just throw out an answer, right? Who do you think is the governing body that oversees us? Who regulates us? What do you think? You can just throw out an answer. SEC. Not the SEC, but that's good. IRS. Not the IRS. Treasury. Not the Treasury. No, states, not the state. FTC. FTC. Yeah, you're the closest. Um, those of you that did not answer were correct. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. We are a hundred percent unregulated by the federal government, which is freaking scary, right? Who holds your money when you do an exchange? We do. Escrow closes. They have to disperse funds to us. We have to hold your funds. We can we we will we have legal title to your funds for up to the 180 days until you close on your replacement property. We can literally do anything we want with your money. We can commingle. Um, we can invest in things to try to make money while we're building it. <laughs> legally, so you go to the pepper. Yeah, I was gonna say since we're in since we're in Reno, yeah, I can take your money to Pepper Mill and I'll be breaking no laws. And try, to up to pull up my dough. try to double up your dough. Um, so it's scary as hell. Right, so you have to be very careful who you use in our industry because there's over the last, I've been doing this 27 years, over the last 20 years, there's been literally over a billion dollars with a B, a billion dollars lost by QIs for a lot of reasons. Some theft and embezzlement, some just bad safeguarding of funds, risky investments, um, bankruptcy, all that stuff. And there's a lot of stories. You know, there's a famous Nevada, Las Vegas. There was a company out of Las Vegas, a QI, Southwest Exchange. Great company. They were around a long time. They were they had number one market share in most of the app. And the people who had started that company were fantastic ethical people. But then they decided to retire after many years. And they put their company up for sale. Well, the person that decided to buy that property was a plastic surgeon in Las Vegas. I think there's only like two of them there. Uh, no, so, so, so um, this plastic surgeon had actually created a patent for a breast implant, and he wanted to go. He thought this is going to be amazing. Uh, if I, if we can just launch this, you know, go public with this, it'll be insane. We'll make tons of money. It'll be huge. No, um, so, so what he did. So the 
the uh, attorney of the plastic surgeon said, hey, you can buy this intermediary, Southwest Exchange. You can use their funds that are in their coffers and to launch your IPO. And of course, when you do that, when you launch an IPO, what's the only direction the stock can go? Up, of yeah. course, always up. Yeah, always, never can go down. So they said, so it'll go up, it'll double in a day, we'll put the money back in the coffers and we'll close everybody's exchange. They did that. And of course it tanked, absolutely tanked, lost their clients' funds, couldn't complete the exchanges. Exchanges failed and taxpayers had to pay their tax. That was not illegal. Nothing about what I just said was illegal. So you have to be super careful, right? With a qualified intermediary. People actually come into the business, set up shop, and then just abscond with the money. There is an actual American Greed. Have you seen American Greed, that show? There's an American Greed 1031 episode, unfortunately. Yeah, there was this... This his name was Ed Opa. I know. He was he was like I don't have enough beer. He was like he was like Bernie Madoff, right? One of those guys. So he wanted this lavish lifestyle, and his his lawyer said, "Hey, buy an exchange company. You can play with the money, and you can buy your toys. You just have to put the money back, and they're going to close their exchanges." So he did, and uh, he started buying yachts, helicopters, jets, beachfront properties in Miami Beach, all that stuff. That was before the Great Recession. The market was insane. Tons of money was coming. Well, then the market tanked. When a market turns like it did then, exchanges stopped, like literally stopped overnight. Uh, and so what happened was there were no new exchanges coming in. He was robbing Peter to pay Paul initially. And when, when no exchanges were coming in, he couldn't take the new money coming in to pay for the old exchange moving out, couldn't liquidate. So all exchanges failed. The, he did actually something illegal. He was, he was actually sentenced to prison, he's since died in prison. But once again, those people lost their money and they had to pay their tax. So you gotta be careful. We are the largest intermediary in the nation. We are, our parent company is Fidelity National Financial, um, a multi-billion dollar corporation, a Fortune 300 company. We put into place voluntarily the highest level of safety and security, not just to protect our clients, but also to protect our status and our stockholders. Right, because of a failure on our end would be devastating to our stock. Um, so we have the highest level of safety, security, and transparency. We, we won't play with your money. I we want you to know we're not playing with your money. Um, because when your funds come into an exchange, we create a segregated commercial bank account that we name you on. So you know we're, we're not playing with your money. You will earn the interest on the funds while we're holding it by us. Um, so you know it's safe. Right? So your, your funds are safest with us. Period in the story. So yeah, thanks for asking. That. Well, what were the fees? Well, what are the fees? Yeah, okay. you didn't <laughs> <try that. laughs> It's like a magic trick. Did the guy that died in jail have his face fixed by the other guy that was in jail? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they got new boobs. <laughs> yeah. So, so the fees. Actually, we don't charge a fee. We just want to hire. For sure. Yeah. No. Just kidding. Uh, so, actually, it, it's just a flat rate fee. Um, so, when you close this one, you're relinquished property. The one you're selling. There will be a one thousand dollar fee charge. That one, and it just comes out of the proceeds of closing, so you don't have to pay for it in advance, right? And then that actually covers the closing of your first replacement property. So if you sell one and buy one, your total cost was just a thousand bucks. That's it, total cost. If you're buying multiple properties, any additional property is three fifty per property. Right? So if you bought one, sold one, bought two, thirteen fifty total cost. And that's it. There's no additional hidden fees or anything like that. That's it. Just flat fee structure. You can talk to me by a thousand times and it doesn't cost a penny. We only charge the fee when we actually do the exchange. And you don't need to be licensed in any particular state? Or... Uh, there's only one state that requires licensing, and that's Idaho. Um, some states will have their own little, um, like Nevada's kind of unique. Nevada says um, that we have to be depositing, if it's a relinquished properties in Nevada, we have to deposit the funds in the Nevada bank. Which is fine to do. We're all set up to do that. Uh, Idaho, we're, not, we're licensed. We, we do business in every single state. And it's, it's just as seamless um, to buy within a state as it is to buy outside of the state. Maybe a too close question, but um, 
year, what proportion of revenues come from that thousand dollars or that three hundred and fifty versus other sources like uh, referral commissions to the DSD workers? Us? Yeah, we can't. So if, if you ask me for a referral to a DSD broker, like, I cannot receive a referral fee from anybody. I'd be fired if I did. Um, so there is, we have no other source. Only source of revenue is that. that That's correct. Us. That is correct. That's our only source of business. We do nothing else other than something that changes. But we deal, like I said, we're we're the 900 pound gorilla. We deal in volumes. Yeah. Um, and the work is pretty easy, right? It's not that big of a deal. It takes a couple hours to set up your exchange. Right? So yeah, I mean, we have to pay for our obviously, but because we deal in volume, we make a profit on that. <laughs> but if you want to pay me, hey, we don't really like your speech. Russ. <laughs> Just kidding. Any other questions? With that, we're probably at our time here. We're at seven o'clock. Thank you very much for having me here this evening. And uh, what's the most important thing you remember from today? Remember, okay. Thank you. My book from when can you call me? Thanks. Thanks.